will introduce you to one of the bloodiest wars of the Victorian era pitting the British Empire of over 500,000 men against just 50,000 of the Boer Republics. The Anglo Boer Wars were fought between 1818 1881 to 1899 to 1902. The two wars were fought between the two Boer Republics of South Africa, the Orange Free State, and the Transvaal against the British Empire and her dominions. This podcast will discuss the political backdrop of the war, a history of the country and the key figures that shaped the conflict. You'll recognise names such as Churchill, Kruger, Rhodes and Kitchener. They had major influences on this war. You'll also recognise familiar characters such as Gandhi, Bandon Powell, Kipling and Conan Doyle. Learn what impacts these people had what they said and how they shaped the war. Between 1835 and 1845, 15,000 people of Dutch extract moved from the Cape Colony into the interior what was now known as South Africa. This was called a Great Trek. It was a direct result of Britain's insistence of equalisation policy between the blacks and whites in the Cape Colony. Emancipated slaves had a devastating effect on the economy, heavily reliant on free slave labour to work the land. Legislation was passed in 1834 which guaranteed equal treatment under the law regardless of race. When slavery was abolished in 1834, the Boers who relied heavily on free slave labour to farm their land opposed the law. Further friction occurred when the Boers believed they were not being compensated sufficiently for their emancipated slaves. Hostilities started to brew in 1833 when English was adopted as the official language of the Utalanda, which is Outlander population. English settlers saw their political influence grow. Two independent republics were established within the interior of South Africa, which was the Transvaal and the Orange Free State, which were recognised by Great Britain at the Sand River and Bluntham Town Conventions in 1852 and 1854 respectively. Although the British still claimed sovereignty all over South Africa, the Boers saw gradual state administration emerge from a near subsistence economy. Enough food was produced to feed the farmer and his family. Imperial ambitions were already evident within the region with the annexation of Batsusu land in 1868. Lord Carnarvon, which was the colonial secretary at the time, suggested a confederation of states within South Africa, a similar confederation that Canada was ruled by in 1867, which aimed at creating a more stable region and greater economic integration under British rule. In 1877, Great Britain peacefully annexed a near bankrupt Transvaal. The Transvaal Boers petitioned London for independence led by Paul Kruger. Once independence was refused, the Transvaal government on 16th of December 1880 declared themselves a republic. The Orange Free State remained neutral throughout the First Boer War. The Boers had no standing units and were an amateur army. Each man wore his everyday clothes, which blended well into the terrain. Each district would form a military unit called a commando. Each burger would bring their own horse and weapon, which was usually a hunting rifle. They also elected their own officers. A staggering 30 to 40,000 men could be mustered within a week. The commandos were an expert mobile force. They used modern Mauser rifles that were smokeless. This wouldn't portray their positions once fired. 
each burger was a crack shot. As a nation, the Boer farmers spent most of their time in the saddle. Law within the Boer nation demanded that each male between the ages of 16 to 60 would serve mandatory commando service in times of need. The commando unit would form the majority of the Boer forces in both Boer wars. Each unit would be attached to a town, with each town divided into districts, then wards. Each commando would be commanded by a commandant, with a ward led by a field corner, which would be equivalent rank to an NCO. Each field corner would be responsible for policing this ward, collecting taxes and issuing firearms in times of war. The commando was made up of volunteers with all officers appointed by members of the commando and not by the government. This policy had both advantages and disadvantages. Commanders such as General Cruz de la Rey and General C. R. DeWitt would prove to be exceptional leaders, men who would not necessarily have been chosen to lead uh, by government appointment. Some less successful commanders were elected by commandos just on the back of local popularity at the time. Discipline would also become a problem as there was no real way to enforce it. Each burger would be responsible for keeping his weapons serviceable and ready at all time. At the outbreak of the war, the Transvaal government issued the commandos with modern clip loading moisture weapons. The build up to the war saw the Boer Republic's acquire Krub and Kruse artillery pieces purchased in readiness. Weapons used in this conflict can be seen today in modern warfare automatic handguns, machine guns, and magazine fed rifles. The rifles the Boers used gave a greater advantage over the rifles used by the British Army. Greater accuracy could be achieved over longer distances. The British fielded the Lee Enfield and Lee Metford rifles with the Boer rifles superior. Heavier wounds were inflicted as the Mauser fired a heavier bullet at a faster pace. The Mausers also had greater sights so there was the potential to fire more accurately over a long distance. British officers also ordered fixed bayonets. This had a detrimental effect on firing as it added an extra 15 pounds of weight at the end of the rifle which would make it harder to hit their target. This war would also see the last use of the lance a 14th century invention used from horseback, the lance was an extremely powerful weapon in a cavalry charge, but would not see major action on such a scale since. Tactics used at the start of the war from a British point of view was a holding action. The Boers would quickly strike and cut off lines of resupply. Ports were also targeted, so the British would find it harder to reinforce units in the interior of South Africa. Ball tactics were cut and thrust, and highly mobile commanded units were perfect for hit and run attacks. British generals used to massive set piece battles with large formations were unused to the ball guerrilla tactics. Heavily dug defences meant it was near impossible for regimental direct assaults. Devastating fire from board defenders would inflict heavy losses on the approaching British forces. When the British positions became threatened, they would just move to the next pre-arranged defences position, a highly mobile force at its best. As the conflict ground on, the British had to learn quickly how to fight a modern war. This was a lesson that helped modernise the British Army and its antiquated thinking and practices. When war broke out, it became clear that the British would uphold the annexation of the Transvaal. The ever-expanded British Empire sought to form a confederation of states and independent republics within the region. If they could not do this peacefully, they would look forward to achieving their end by other remains. Lord Camarden told Disraeli, the British Prime Minister, quote, By acting at once we may acquire 
the whole Transvaal Republic, after which the Orange Tree State will surely follow. Political problems within the Transvaal government led to unrest at home and in the bankrupt economy, with some burghers wanted British rule. Fighting broke out on the 20th of December 1880 when a column of British infantry were ambushed by troops led by General Piet Joubert at Bunkramsburg, South Pretoria. A wave of attacks followed against 1,800 British troops scattered over the Transvaal in small forts. None of the forts were captured. So Major General George Coley, who had recently succeeded the first High Vice Count of Wolseley, Governor of Natal, who was also responsible for the Transvaal, Coley was given conflicting orders, negotiated peace while reinforcements were sent. Coley advanced to Lang's Neck, the frontier, with the Transvaal and Natal with just a thousand men. His force lacked artillery and regular cavalry and were made up of regular and local troops. On the 28th of January, faced with the, twice the amount of troops, a frontal assault failed to open this route. Another failure proceeded on the 18th of February when 300 of his men were attacked at Ingolgo River. On the 26th of February, Coley led 350 men on a night march to capture Majuba Hill, which was strategically important in the area as this hill dominated the pass below. Under heavy fire, Joubert sent 180 men in small parties onto the hill while their superior marksmanship and modern tactics caused a British rout. Coley was killed with almost all his men. London sent significant reinforcements under Frederick Roberts, billed as one of the most able field commanders since Wellington. Major General Evelyn Wood was ordered to negotiate an armistice. Agreement was reached on the 21st of March, before Roberts' reinforcements reached Cape Town. Peace was officially sealed with the Pretoria Convention in August, which restored the Transvaal independence with British sovereignty. This was removed in the London Convention of 1884, at which the Transvaal changed its name to the South African Republic. The 29th of December 1895 to the 2nd of January 1896 was a raid carried out by Dr Leander Starr Jameson, a British colonial statesman, with the aim to incite an uprising in the Transvaal. His ultimate aim was of overthrowing Paul Kruger as the leader of the Transvaal government and installing a new leader who would be more favour to the British. The raid was a complete failure and the political fallout had a major contributing factor on the Second War. The Second Boer War starting, with tens of thousands of Utalanda settling in the region after gold was discovered, which waters ran in 1886, the political independence of the government was threatened. With the local government relying heavily on the revenue generated by the gold mines, the Utalanda population was consistently refused the franchise's rights. The Utalanders was consistently refused the franchise rights. They were firmly incensed when the qualifying period for citizenship was upped. The Transvaal administration was considered ultra-conservative in economic and industrial policy. The local mining magnates, most of which were not Transvaal citizens, demanded a greater political voice. The Cape Connolly government mistrusted the Transvaal government over Kruger's attempt to claim control of Betuland which contravened the 1884 London Convention. As a result, the region was declared a British protectorate. Dr James first arrived in South Africa in 1878, lured by diamonds discovered in Kimberley. He was a close friend of Cecil Rhodes, who was one of the founders of the De Beer Mining Company. Rhodes would go on to become Prime Minister of the Cape Colony. An ardent believer in British colonisation, he would create the state of Rhodesia, which would later be renamed Zimbabwe. In 1889, Rhodes would form the British South African Company. The company would be given a royal charter. 
with Jameson acting as emissary, Rose sent a pioneer column into Mashaland, now northern Zimbabwe, and into Metabiland, now southwest Zimbabwe and parts of Botswana. Jameson was installed as administrator for both regions. In 1895, Jameson was commissioned by Rhodes to lead a force of 600 mountain men into Transvaal to support an expected Utlanda uprising in Johannesburg. The force comprised of 400 Metabaland mounted police, 200 volunteers and six Maxim guns with three light artillery pieces. The hoped uprising by the Utlanders failed to happen and Jameson's forces were confronted on January 1st, 1896 by a number of Transvaal soldiers blocking a road across the intended route to Johannesburg. As night fell, Jameson withdrew his troops with the aim of outflanking the blocking force. Small skirmishes broke out and Jameson's plan to outflank the Boer force became impossible. Jameson was forced to surrender along with 600 men 20 kilometres west from Johannesburg at Dawn Cop on January 2nd, 1896. The Utlander ringleaders and Jameson were handed back to the British authorities in Cape to be transported back to Great Britain for trial in London. Treason charges were initially thrown at Jameson and various Utlander leaders, which meant they were sentenced to death. But upon appeal, but upon appeal, the sentences were commuted to token prison sentences and heavy fines. For his part in the raid, Jameson received a 15-month prison sentence, which he only served four months. The British South African Company was required to pay one million pounds in compensation to the Transvaal government. The aftermath of the Jameson raids. The aftermath of the Jameson raid saw the international community sympathise with the Transvaal government. Paul Kruger, the leader of the Transvaal government, achieved re-election in 1896 against a fierce rival on Piet Jaber. Cecil Rhodes retired as Cape Colony Prime Minister and died in 1902. Jameson returned to South Africa in 1900 and in 1902 took the leadership of the Progression Party. He was elected Prime Minister of Cape Colony in 1904. He became the leader of the Unionist Party in 1910 after the Union of South Africa. 1914 saw Jameson retire from politics and he died in 1917. negotiations took place in Bloemfontein. On the agenda were the heavily debated issue of the Uttalanda rights and the control of the gold mining industry and the British Empire's aim of establishing United South Africa under British control. The Boer Republics realised that as Uttalanda's members grew, the majority of which were English, then by granting full voting rights would mean a loss of control from the ethnic Boers to the British Empire. Negotiations failed and in September 1899, British Colonial Secretary Joseph Chamberlain demanded full voting rights and representation for the all Uttalanders in the Transvaal. Paul Kruger, the president of the Transvaal Republic, was outraged and countered with his own demands. He gave 48 hours for the British government to withdraw all troops from the borders of Transvaal and the Orange Free State, or the Transvaal and the Orange Free State would declare war. The British government rejected the ultimatum and war was declared on the 11th of October 1899. The British government rejected the ultimatum and war was declared on the 11th of October 1899. The Boers struck first blood on 12th of October at Crapin. The Boers were incredibly quick to mobilise and military success was achieved early in the war. This would be the start of the invasion of the Cape Conley and the Conley of Natal. Quick mobilisation saw quick results and surprise attacks at Ladysmith, Kimberley and Mafeking. Talana Hill on the 20th of October 1899 was the site for the first engagement of the war. 
Boer forces began shelling the British camp at the coal mining town of Dundee. Major General Penn Simmons was in command of a brigade at Dundee. He ordered a counterattack and drove the Boers from the Talana Hill summit while suffering heavy losses. 444. So go back. At this point, because we're uh, we're talking about, well, it might be worth speeding up the um, the sound of the um, the drumming, um, which is played constantly, um, just to get some tension. He ordered a counter-attack and drove the balls from Talana Hill Summit while suffering heavy losses. 446 casualty, including Simmons himself. Another ball force occupied and glanced at that between Dundee and Ladysmith. Lines of communication to Dundee were cleared when Major General John French and his troops inflicted a tactical victory. The threat of another Boer attack saw these troops ordered back to Dundee, throwing away any tactical advantages they had achieved. Boer forces fired on Lady Smith with heavy artillery. The siege would last for several months. Sir George Stuart White, divisional commander at Lady Smith, ordered a major sortie against the Boer positions. Disaster struck when 140 men were killed and over a thousand taken prisoner. Meanwhile, 6,000 Boers under command of Piet Kronje attacked Mafking, which was a key resupply facility due to his railway junction. Colonel Robert Bandon Powell had raised 12,000 local men in two regiments to attack and create diversions in the area, were now faced with defending Mafking. On the 13th of October, the 217 day siege of Mafking began. What started with tax on the attack quickly subsided into the attacking force, happy to starve out the besieged garrison. Kimberley was also subject to a siege, but not as significant. 7,500 Boers besieged Kimberley from November, and they were happy to starve out the defenders into submission also. Lieutenant Colonel Robert Keatwich headed the defence with Cecil Rose playing a significant role also. General Sir Redvers Henry Butler arrived with major reinforcements, an army corps of three divisions. Sir Redvers, a highly respected commander, quickly established that he needed to relieve the besieged cities by splitting his force. A division commanded by Lieutenant General Lethuan to follow the Western Railway north and relieve Kimberley and Mafeking. 3,000 men under Major General William Gataker were to secure the railway junction at Stormberg, which would secure the Midlands districts from raids and prevent any further rebellion. Bullo would himself lead the remainder of the forces to relieve Lady Smith. Lord Methuen, in a bid to push north to relieve Kimberley, won several skirmishes at Belmont on the 23rd of November and at Graspian at the twin, on the 25th of November. A large battle fought at Moda River on the 28th of November saw British losses of 71 dead and over 400 wounded. The 10th and 15th of December 1899 would be referred to as Black Week, a disastrous period for the British Army to date. All three major fronts would suffer heavy losses with defeats at Stomberg, Magusfontein and Colenso. 2,776 men were killed, wounded or taken prisoner. Major changes at home would be implemented because of Black Week. The British government quickly realised the war would not be won quickly and had to change their mindset or risk further damning defeats. Changes in military personnel, mobilisation and modernisation in the army would be introduced it would be introduced to match the Boer troops. The Boers fought with better equipment, were more mobile and with modern tactics. The British army had to change. The 10th of December saw General Gataker try to recapture Stormberg Railway Junction. British defeat ensured with 135 men killed or wounded, with two guns captured and 600 men taken prisoner. 
On the 11th of December, Lord Mathian's 14,000 troops attempted to capture a board position for an attack to relieve Kimberley. The Battle of Magus Fontaine was yet and again another fiasco when the Highland Brigade was pinned down by boar fire. Extreme heat and lack of water for nine hours prompted the Highlanders to break and form an ill-disciplined retreat. 120 men were lost and 690 wounded. The siege of Kimberley remained. Black Week cultivated with the Battle of Colenso on the 15th of December. Buller, with 21,000 British troops, tried to relieve Ladysmith, where 8,000 Transvaal Boers under Louis Bother prevented them from crossing the Tugela River. All attempts to cross the river were ex- repelled. Buller ordered a retreat, leaving 10 field guns and many wounded men and isolated units to be captured by Bother's men. 145 men were killed and 1,200 men missing or wounded, with the Boers suffering just 8 killed and 40 wounded. Two further divisions were sent by the British government, with a large number of colonial volunteers. In January 1990, numbers sent overseas amounted to 180,000, the largest ever to date, whilst also more requested. A further bid to relieve Ladysmith was ordered by Buller under the command of Major General Charles Warren. Warren successfully crossed the Tugela River west of Colenso. He encountered defensive position as being cop. Warren's troops could capture Hill by surprise in the early hours of the 24th of January 1900. As dawn broke, the British realised that the ball gun emplacements were overlooking their nearly captured position. Disaster resulted when British commanders issued conflicting orders. Some men ordered to reinforce the hill while all others were told to retreat. An inglorious retreat back across the Tuliga River followed with British casualties amounting to 350 men killed and nearly a thousand injured. The Boers suffered 300 casualties in response. Bullet issued orders for another attack on the 5th of January 1900 at Valkrets and was again defeated by Lewis Botha. Yet another retreat, this time after Buller thought he was isolated at a bridgehead crossing Telega River. Sir Reverse was the nickname given to Buller because of the number of withdrawals he ordered. Buller's performance negative reports from the field got back to the British government. The direction of the war was lost and Buller was no longer deemed the right man for the job. A replacement was chosen in the form of Field Marshal Lord Roberts, who would become Commander-in-Chief. Lord Roberts' first order was to relieve the sieges of Lady Smith, Kimberley and Mafeking. Roberts massed his main body of men near the Orange River and planned to attack along the Western Railway, with a wide outflanking move to relieve the garrison at Kimberley. Meanwhile in Nital, the war came to a standstill. The Boers at Lady Smith only made one attempt to storm the town. No attempt was made to exploit the victory of Stormberg, and the dry summer weakened the Boers' horses and oxen. Boer families joined their men in the field, further weakening Cronje's army. Roberts launched his main attack on the 10th of February 1900 and managed to outflank the Boers at Magus Fontaine. A cavalry attack led by Major General John French on the 15th of February saw the siege of Kimberley relieved. Even though severe fire was encountered, a mass cavalry charge managed to break the Boer defences and lift the 124 day siege. French cavalry was then ordered to support Robert's force, which was then pursued by Piet Conger's 7,000 men, which had attempted to cross the Moda River. Croger's troops were surrounded and the Battle of Paderberg was fought between 18 to the 27th of February. A pincer movement involving French cavalry and the main body of the army tried to take the board defences. The attack was easily repelled. Roberts resorted to bombarding Croger into submission but would cost Roberts a further 10 days. General Croger surrendered with 4,000 men at Surrender Hill. During this time, British forces were forced to use the Moda River as a water supply. A typhoid epidemic broke out, killing many troops. 
The 4th attempt to relieve Lady Smith by Buller on the 14th of January saw heavy resistance at the Battle of Togela Heights. Going was very slow even when reinforcements arrived. Buller marshalled all his troops and concentrated them in one main attack, finally forcing a crossing of Togela River. Balthus' forces facing the British were outnumbered and finally defeated the day after Conger surrendered. The siege of Ladysmith had lasted 118 days. Buller's victory lifted the siege. The cost of Buller's men was 7,000 British casualties. Defeat followed defeat for the Boers. Morale was low and slow realisation dawned that the war was lost. Roberts was quick to capitalise on his victories by advancing into the Orange Free State, scattering the Boer forces against him at the Battle of Poplar Grove and capturing Bloemfontein and Post, which was capital of the Orange Free State Republic. The Boer's defenders quickly slipped away without defending their capital. A small force detached from the main body of the army in the Orange Free State was sent to relieve Mafeking. The siege was lifted on the 18th of May, with the British public celebrating wildly and naming Bandon Powell, the officer commanding the defence of Mafeking, a hero. The British annexed the Orange Free State on the 28th of May, renaming it the Orange River Colony. The war in the Transvaal was resumed after a brief hope. Enteric fever caused by dirty water and poor hygiene broke out in the British camp. Supplies were short and the collapse of Robert's supply lines meant a several week delay at Blomfontein. A further 10 days were wasted at Kronstadt where medical and food supplies failed to catch up with his advancing army. Finally, on the 31st of May, Pretoria was captured without a fight, having moved all its defences artillery out into the field with the Boer army and nothing left to defend the town. Johannesburg, the capital of the Transvaal Republic, was captured on the 5th of June 1900. With both Boer War capitals in British hands and all the main cities under British control, Roberts were able to clear the war over, but the Boers had other ideas. A meeting at Kronstadt elected a new temporary capital of the Transvaal. Saw Boer generals plan to carry on the fight with the British with the guerrilla war. The last set major battle of the war was at Diamond Hill on the 11th of June, where Roberts attempted to drive the remains of the Boerfield army away from Pretoria. Even though Roberts' force was able to drive the Boers from the hill, they suffered a greater number of casualties, 162 men to 50 Boers. Both had declared the Battle of Diamond Hill a victory for the Boers. Kruger, the president of the Transvaal, along with the rest of his movement, retreated to Eastern Transvaal. Roberts, combining his force with Wood Buller, advanced toward their positions on the 26th of August, breaking the Boers' last stand at Bergen Dar. Kruger fled into Portuguese East Africa, now Mozambique, and sought asylum. A number of Boers followed, leaving valuable supplies. The new guerrilla phase of the war made mobility for the Boers even more valuable, so the loss of key supplies was not a great loss. The bitter end. The British had declared the war over, but the Boers had done anything but surrender. It would be another 18 months before the war was truly finished. The final phase of the war would mimic a guerrilla war in all but name, though technically not classed as a guerrilla war, as the Boers had not officially surrendered. The main Boer army was broken in the field. Their units spread throughout the Boer republics, but their fighting spirit still remained. A vow to no surrender and fight to the bitter end was declared. These final fighting Boers were called bitter enders, Leadership was handed to Sharp Berger and the Commandant General to the Republic's Army, Louis Bofa. Kruger eventually fled to Europe, a broken man. In the Orange Free State, now called the Orange River Connolly, President Stein led his government in exile wherever he happened to be. Generals Booth and Delaray still commanded large bodies of men. The highly mobile Boers lived on the land or carried what supplies they could which sustained them in the field. 
The Boer Commandos like mounted infantry harassed and ambushed British units and outposts wherever possible, also attacking British lines of communication. Every chance to attack the British was taken, attacking fast and causing maximum damage before retiring before any substantial casualties could be suffered and major British reinforcements could be called. While both republics have been officially annexed, no troops were used to occupy these territories. The final stages of the war were made up of large numbers of British troops trying to cover a vast area, slowly but surely resisting the Boer raids. At this point, the Boers felt the British were now trying to exterminate the Boer people as a race and cause a genocide to accord and the British found it more and more difficult to differentiate from friend or foe. A large number of Orange Free States Boers surrendered to Robert's army, agreeing to pledge an oath for neutrality before allowing them to return home, but only if they did not take any more part of the war. President Stein and Kruger, the leader of the poor republics, did not recognise their annexation of their states or the end of the war so would not accept the surrender of Boer rights to pledge an oath of neutrality. The Boer commanders, still fighting in the field, targeted the neutralised Boers, threatening them with immediate punishment for desertion. Whilst the British would seek reprisals for any neutralised Boer going back on their oath once home, Roberts ordered the farms burnt of any Boer who broke their oath. A circle of reprisals took place, by the British and the Boers. The British offered little in way of support for the Boer farmers or homesteads, but did offer camps of refuge for any surrendered Boer. These camps would later be called concentration camps. A safe refuge, according to the British, or a prison camp claimed by the Boers. The Boers struck first at Sanna's post on the 1st of March, where 1,500 Boers under Christian de Witt attacked Bloemfontein's waterworks about 23 miles from the city. A heavily escorted convoy was attacked, causing 155 British casualty, capturing seven artillery pieces and 117 supply wagons. 428 British troops were captured. in Great Britain quickly diminished when reports of harsh treatment of the Boer people got back to London. The government's policy was questioned in Parliament as a result. David Lloyd George, future Prime Minister, attacked the government on the issue of policy and directly challenged the internment of Boers in concentration camps. Secretary of War Sir John Broderick argued that the camps were there to comfortably house or families that had lost their homesteads and farms. When he claimed that this agreement was voluntary, he quickly changed his defence to claim that the camps were of purely military reasons and everything possible was being done to ensure satisfactory conditions in the camp. Emily Hobhouse, a welfare campaigner from Cornwall, went to South Africa to distribute funds raised for South African women. Upon arriving in the Cape Colony, Emily encountered several camps and would go on to write a damning report that was presented to the government, protesting at the harsh treatment in humane and inhumane conditions she witnessed. The report was published in June 1901 and upon support from the British Liberal leader Sir Henry Campbell Bannerman was found. The government was forced to set up a review of the situation led by Dame Millicent Fawcett to investigate her claims. The Fawcett Commission would later corroborate Hobhouse's claims. An all-women affair, the Commission's ladies personally toured each camp and recorded their findings. Uproar was created at home and abroad when facts emerged. A detailed report was demanded from Kitchener. 
only statistical returns were provided to commission with an astonishing 90,000 Boers and 25,000 blacks interning in the camps with a high death rate also provided, especially high among children. The report also included what steps needed to be taken. The level of rationing needed to be increased. More nurses had to be sent over to the colonies and basic hygiene had to be improved if the camps were to be deemed satisfactory. Joseph Chamberlain, colonial secretary, demanded the rate of mortality reduced with every step needed to be taken. The civilian authorities in the Boer colonies took over the running of the camps and the death rate did decrease. However, from that point, when in four interniers, mostly children died. Starvation, disease and exposure were the main killers in the camp. The black camps were even worse, with improvements slow in coming. No official numbers from the black camps were given as little was attempted to keep up any records. Kitchener would say, quote, This was not a deliberately genocidal policy. Rather, it was the result of a disastrous lack of foresight and rank incompetence on the part of the British military. Radical politics in the region were carefully thought out. A mass mobilisation of the black population would prove disastrous. The contribution of black Africans played in the war was downplayed to pacify the Boers. Campaign medals were not issued to African blacks to recognise their efforts. Boers were favoured over blacks when making future plans. Racial politics from then on caused much bitterness and evil and upheaval. Upon signing the Treaty of Vernoining on the 31st of May 1902, three million pounds were pledged to the British government for the reconstruction of the Boer Republics and eventual self-government promised. Self-government was achieved in 1906 and 1907 as independent Boer Republics within the British Empire. The Union of South Africa would be formed after the peace treaty was signed and South Africa would go on to become a key ally of Britain during both world wars. Opposition to the British support still existed with the bitter enders and they refused to fight for the British Empire, especially against Germany who had been pro-Boer during the South African conflict. A short-lived uprising in 1916 called the Maritz Uprising was quickly suppressed. The bitter enders shifted their efforts from military to political and formed the National Party that would take power in 1948 and dominate politics in South Africa up until the end of the 20th century. The National Party ruled under the apartheid system, the segregation of the blacks and whites. The National Party ruled under the apartheid system, the segregation of blacks and whites in South Africa. Quotes, Winston Churchill. The position of a prisoner of war is painful and humiliating. A man tries his best to kill another and finding that he cannot succeed, asks his enemy for mercy. The laws of war demand that this should be accorded, but it is impossible not to feel a humbling obligation to the captor from whose hand we take our lives. All military pride, or independent spirit must be put aside. These may be carried to the grave, but not into captivity. We must prepare ourselves to submit, to obey, to endure. Certain things, sufficient food and water and protection during good behavior, the victim must supply or be savage. Beyond all these else is favor. Favours must be accepted for those with whom we have a long and bitter quarrel for these 
who feel fiercely that we seek to do them cruel injustice. The dog who has been whipped must be thankful for the bone that is flung to him. Cecil Rhodes. In every colonial legislature, the society should attempt to have its members prepared at all times to vote or speak and advocate the closer union of England and the colonies to crush all disloyalty and every moment for the sovereignty of our empire. Rudyard Kipling. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting or being lied about, don't deal in lies or being hated. Don't give way to hating and yet don't look too good nor talk too wise. The end. Thank you for listening to this podcast on the two Boer Wars, a brief history Like all new podcasts, we rely on the generosity of you listeners. Please view our show notes with a link to our website. On the website, you'll have maps, timelines, and African word definitions. Please also share on Twitter, on Facebook. Again, we appreciate you listening. And if you can share on social media, ask your friends and family to listen also. We'd be internally grateful. Please listen carefully for next week's show on the Zulu Wars. Thank you.